You're listening to the Racer to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your motorsports merchandising needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack. Co-host. You may have seen him walking out of a great clips, and it looks like recently, um, <laughs> with a big old smile on his face, he is Scott Bowie. Hey, Scott. What's going on, Aaron? I'm good. Um, like the haircut. Never oh, thought we would, would see um, the mane go away, but I think we finally. Well, it, like I told you before, um, last year when COVID came around in the office, you know, we got sent home from work to work from home. Uh, my mom had always liked my hair longer, so I grew it out uh, for her. And of course, as anybody who watches uh, knows that she passed, and uh, and it was time to cut it. It it was just you know I go outside, any wind, it's in my face, and and it just didn't look great. And so it was time to go. Well, <laughs> looks good, um, but. We, we have a great show to, today. Um, current IndyCar driver, IndyCar team owner. He's won a few IndyCar races at Carpenter. It was a great interview. It was a great interview. He's so kind. He took time out. He was going to test the Gateway before the Gateway race. And uh, it was a really good talk. And, and Ed, you know, a lot of people forget, uh, come from the open wheel ranks, and he ran midgets and sprint cars and silver crown cars and uh, and that's where I'd kind of talked to him. He ran the TQ series, which for people who don't know, it's called three quarter midgets. Um, and he really cut his teeth, uh, in Indiana, like an Indiana racer. And, you know, he runs so good to speedway and, and, uh, you know, and he's obviously his ties to the speedway through his family. And, uh, it was just a really good talk. And, and he shared what I thought was a really great story about Tony George and, yeah. Uh, just uh, the humility that Tony, you know, truly had. You know, Tony's kind of a unknown, right? Because he's always kind of so quiet. And I thought that was a really good story uh, about Tony. So he shares that in there. But uh, Ed just was a great talk. Absolutely. And wanted to thank everyone for listening. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit like and subscribe below. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, any other podcast streaming platform, please make sure you follow us there as well. We appreciate all the support. Yeah, boy, I sure do. I remember talking to you like, hey, man, do you think uh, we'll get to 50 subscribers? And I looked the other day and we got to 50 last month and we're at 62 now. And hopefully it keeps going up just, just because that means people are listening and hopefully enjoying uh, what they're listening to. And uh, I said it before, and I'll say it every show if I have to, but uh, I just want to thank everybody for listening. It, it truly means a lot to me. I know it means a lot to Aaron, and I just really appreciate it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right there. So this week in racing, so we had IndyCar, Laguna Seca, Colton Herta wins. Colton Herta wins, um, but... The championship uh, uh, picture has gotten pretty clear. Yeah. And uh, it's down to three. It's Alex's to lose or down to three. Uh, Joseph Newgarden could come out of nowhere with the Hail Mary. Um, And he might, you know, boy, he had a rough, rough day at at, uh, Laguna Seca. And, you know, that was a race that he has run pretty good at in the past. So. I don't know. Um, exciting race. I mean, even, you know, of course, Colton really dominated. But, uh, man, you thought Rossi might have a shot, and, you know, and he's sitting sideways within the first three laps. Um, but, man, there was a it was a fight throughout the pack, just a dog fight. Yeah, what about Romain Grosjean, that guy? How about that guy? That one video of him going around Dixon looked like a video game. I mean, yeah. he was – just flying yeah and talk about struggling i mean that you know and i know i've mentioned anybody's listened to the show before and anybody that listened to our uh, indy 500 preview um david land said that he was told and i'm sure it's by colton herta that's just just a guess by me that uh, a driver had told him that dixon 
was fast, but wasn't, couldn't pass. And that seems to have been kind of the entire season from that point on is, is they can go fast, but they're not fast enough and they're, they're missing more than they're hitting on their setups. And uh, I don't know if that's because the competition's different, but uh, it's been interesting to watch. It'll be interesting to see how they respond to it because uh, they're not going to take that lying down. He, you know, he's going to be happy for his teammate if his teammate wins the championship. But, you know, Scott Dixon wins number seven. And it's going to be oh, yeah. really interesting to see how they recover from this. Yeah, but there's a reason why they call him the Iceman. So that's right. If there's anyone that's able to do it, it'd be Scott. But I, I think he's just too far out of it at this point. Well, he's done. Uh, points yeah, wise, he is. Right. yeah. So there, there's yeah. only three left. Right. It, it's uh, Alex Pato and uh, Newgarden. Right. And Pato drove. Pato gave everything he had and got everything out of that race car the other day. Now he, like he said, he said that was it. He said that's all it had. Um, and you know, you're talking about Romain. Uh, how about the crowd after the race just embracing him and cheering him? Um, I don't know if you saw any of that, yeah. but uh, and then there was a giant crowd of people around him, uh, and he was exciting. And he, you know, uh, poor J- Jimmy Johnson. Uh, while Jimmy had a great day for Jimmy, um, and I don't mean that as a slight, I mean, he's racing against, you know, you, you run 16th, 17th in these races. Now you're racing against really good guys. Right. When you look at the times, I mean, first off, the field's just so competitive, but you're talking right. about, you know, 10th and 200th of a second. I mean, just very small margins. And I mean, he's yeah. really not that far off. I mean, he's far he's enough not. off to be, you know, kind of near the back of the field, but I mean, it's pretty close margins, really. He had some great passes. He had a great pass on Hinchcliffe, mm-hmm. um, who is no slouch as a driver. And um, you know, McGrove John come in there, man, like he was running a quarter mile dirt track, <laughs> got into the side and got that thing up on one wheel. And uh, but they all stayed going, and it all it ultimately cost uh, cost for me because it broke the uh, some of the body work, and he was never as fast after that. But uh, it was exciting to watch, and, and um, I think he passed. What they say he had what twenty seven passes on track, and yeah, you know, like, I mean, he like, moved up pretty quickly. And it was like fifteen for I forget how they worded it. I, not necessarily for position, but it was like fifteen like advanced. Um, but uh, Laguna, man, that, that track is uh, that's become a driver's track. I mean, that thing's really technically difficult yeah and that was the first time i think romaine had ever driven on it yeah and you would never guess that by looking at him race there right uh i think he really embraced it oh know? he's i mean he's having the time of his life i mean he he's coming from you know race of formula one where he wasn't competitive for at least five or six years he had a couple years I forget, was it with Lotus? It was with someone, and he was. I don't remember who it was. But he yeah, had he, some podiums, yeah. Yeah, and he and he was, you know, semi-competitive all year, and then since then, so I totally get it. And, you know, he was. I I saw a comment he made about, um, you know, other F1 drivers saying that you know it's a, if if you can't be with a top team, you know, coming over to IndyCar is a great option. So right. I definitely think we'll see more, you know, more drivers kind of do that. And I know we were supposed to see Alex Albon come over. And obviously that was just to uh, show F1 teams that he, um, you know, that he was trying to keep doors open because, you know, last week or whatever he got announced. I forget what F1 team it was, but he's going back to F1. Yeah, he got snatched up, you know, and I, I'm sure the money's better. Oh, I, yeah. I, I assume the money's a lot better. and, and uh, But it's a lot different atmosphere, too. You know, it, it's... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, I don't know any of the particulars, but it's it's a different atmosphere, and it's a real pressure cooker over there, and, and they don't care, you know, if the car isn't right or whatever. It's always going to be the driver's fault. It's never going to be the engineer's fault, I can tell you that. No, absolutely not. And then NASCAR, we had Kyle Larson wins Bristol. Yep, I think it's the first time he ever won Bristol. Um, he looked good doing it. You know, uh, uh, Harvey and uh, Chase, Chase Elliott, Elliott. kind of got into it, and and, um, and that led to 
Larson win the race because Elliott made life difficult for uh, Harvick and uh, Larson won. And then they got to have a nice discussion about it afterwards, Harvick and Elliott. And, and hey, that stuff, you know, that stuff is great for the sport. It really is. I mean, you know, it's great publicity. People love it. Um, you know, Harvick kept his helmet on. People were talking about that. Right. You know, um, they were just talking about, uh, I mean, they, 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 I've seen some polls and that, and a lot of people just felt like that was one of the best Bristol races they've seen in years. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's funny to see that place not full because it always used to just be jam packed. Oh yeah. There used to be like a f- four or five year waiting list to get tickets. Yeah. And, it, and um, you heard uh, Dale Jr. kind of put a little dig on cause they put dirt on it at the beginning of the year. And I forget exactly what he said, but he's, you know, he's like basically saying, Hey, this place is, we don't need to put dirt on, you know, to be fast and or to be good show, I should say. And um, and I honestly think he's right. You know that it's as a dirt guy, I I don't mind it. Right. I mean, I get but what they're trying to do. I do. I, I just there's but there's a part of me that thinks you know a lot of those sprint car teams and late model teams and that they to go that fast. Man, that that place is wicked fast. And I don't know if it's really should be done, but whatever. I mean, I'm the first person to tell you that I miss watching sprint cars and midgets on the mile. So who am I to say anything about speed, right? But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think Bristol's okay to watch with the dirt on it, but it's meant for the pavement. It's meant to, you know, to be that Coliseum atmosphere and, Hopefully for NASCAR, they can get back to that. Um, you know, it, it's just, I think it's been, I mean, for whatever reason, I don't know in the ins and outs of why things change, but they change for some reason. And hopefully they can get it back to where it's not that way anymore and they can fill that place back up. Yeah, for sure. Um, what is there any other racing news we're missing? I mean, those are the two big main stories, I think. Man, yeah, nothing in um, nothing big. I mean, Almondinger and them had that crash coming, you know, for the Xfinity race had that crash coming to the line, and and you know he won, and and uh, that was a you know pretty spectacular race. But um, other than that, I don't know. I didn't follow the truck race, and um. As far as other racing, I'm I'm not quite sure what else happened in the world of racing um, last weekend. So, other than that, that's kind of all I know about racing last weekend. I think the biggest news was Scott Bauer got his haircut. Yeah, I know uh, it's disappointing a lot of people, I believe, but it was time. (laughs) That was a lot of hair, man. Yes, it was. Well, I think we'll go ahead and just get right into the interview with that carpenter. Hope everyone's in, hope everyone enjoys. Yeah, me too. It, it was it's a it was a fun talk, and I hope everybody enjoys it. Our guest today is a three-time IndyCar race winner and a three-time Indy 500 pool winner. He is a current IndyCar driver, IndyCar team owner. We are joined by Ed Carpenter. Hey, Ed, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, no problem. No, I mean, obviously, I've I've been at the track. Um, and seen you in the track for the past like 15 years. Um, so I definitely knew when we started this a couple months ago, I wanted to have you on at some point. Um, so I definitely, you know, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, we've, uh, I've seen you grow up over the years and you've seen me <laughs> become an old race car driver. Yeah, no, I've, I, <laughs> I've definitely seen you come a long way. So, um, no, it's, <laughs> it's been great. So talk a little bit about how you first got interested in racing. Um, I mean, it was all really by chance and luck or fate, I imagine. Um, my my parents divorced when I was young, and my mom started dating and, and married Tony George in uh, 1989. And at that point, he asked myself and, and my brother, who was my stepbrother at the time, if we wanted to, to try racing quarter midgets. And both jumped at it and that was that's where it all started never looked back 
Right. No, that's great. And then, so after quarter midgets, you um, kind of went through the USAC ranks a little bit, right? You were doing USAC midgets? Yeah, so I, so I started racing quarter midgets when I was eight. Um, we raced quarter midgets for eight years back then. And like everyone raced lower levels until they were a little older, so um, I did that. And then I had one year at three-quarter midgets. And then um, started racing USAC midgets in 1998 um, when I was 17. 16th Street Speedway Old Bush Stadium had kind of a weekly series, and that's mainly what I did um, my first year in midgets, and then went national USAC in 1999. And then from 99, um, 2001, I was just racing USAC, and 2002, Indy Lights was formed, so I started uh, Indy Lights at that point. Still had a USAC schedule as well, um, well into 2003, was mainly focusing on lights, and still ran Silver Crown and a couple other USAC races when I would, when I would get different opportunities, and then transitioned to IndyCar from there, so it's all... Right, Thinking so, back on my time, it felt like I it felt like I was in USAC for a while, but really it was not all that long of a time. <laughs> with hindsight, with how long I've been in IndyCar now. Oh yeah, I know for sure. So, would you say when you started, um, like racing USAC, your your end goal was to end up in IndyCar and race in the Indy 500, or I guess what was your goal? Yeah, absolutely. For me, you know, in IndyCar, the Indy 500 was was always where I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, like all young young drivers, you know, you always think you're going to get there, um, but you never really know. And, you know, the Indy Lights forming in 2002 was a really big step for me um, to be able to get that opportunity. And, you know, that's when I felt like it was all possible and a reality. To, to be able to make it happen, um, but and Silver Crown was great too, just because at that at the point when I was in Silver Crown, you would have a lot of guys come back and and race those cars that had already moved on, whether it was Tony Stewart or Ryan Newman, um, guys that had made the transition from USAC to IndyCar or NASCAR, and that that was kind of where I really like I could compete at the next level with, with drivers like that just from racing with them on on the USAC circuit and competing with them. Um, you know, with Indy Lights is what really paved the way just to make the transition to IndyCar and learn about the rear engine car and how they work, uh, the differences in how you drive them. So it, it, it would have been interesting had, had Indy Lights not come back at, at that stage, you know, it's, it's, it would have been interesting if I would have been able to make the transition or not. Right, and you got your first taste of victory in Indy Lights pretty early in your second year when you were driving for um, AJ Foyt, and you you got to one at um you know the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What what was that like? Oh, that was amazing. Um, you know that that was the second year of Indy Lights, but it was the first year that the lights cars ran at the speedway. Um, so that was the first Freedom 100, as it was called huh. back then. I didn't realize that. Cool. I was driving for, yeah, I was driving for AJ, which was super special. You know, I <laughs> learned a ton of things from him um, <laughs> in general, but but really, especially at, in, especially at Indy, you know, really lucky to have been able to have worked with him and you know, kind of hear what, what he considers to be important you know, to having having a fast car at Indy. And they're things that I still still think about today. You, um, yeah, I got a chance to watch you a lot in the midgets and the Silver Crown car, and uh, you ran the sprint car. You know, you were teamed up with Potters, uh, you know, on midget deal, and and uh, and Tracy took care of that sprint car for a while, right? Uh, yeah, so I worked with Tracy 
Um, T. Hughes. Starting in 98. Worked together yeah. from 98, 99. Um, into part of 2001. And then kind of transitioned to working with Joe Kennedy, Jeff Sinden, Chris LaFollett. Kind of started taking care of my cars uh, midway through 2001. But yeah, I mean, I had, I had known the Potters for a long time before I even got in midgets. I kind of hung out with them and was friends with some of their drivers and traveled with them. Uh, so I had known the Potters for, for a long time. You ended up, uh, you actually won a couple of races on the, on the banks, right? At Winchester? Uh, Salem. Was, Salem, okay. My I bad. never won it. Never won it. Won two sprint car races at Salem. Uh, would have been 2000, 2001 and 2002, I believe. Yeah, 2001 and two. Yeah, that's, you know, and I imagine, you know, running sprint cars at Salem and that had to help prepare for uh, the speeds and, and that you would face later on. Yeah, I mean, I I love Salem and Winchester for whatever reason. I had a little bit more of an act for Salem. Um, but it, it definitely probably requires, you know, I think everywhere requires commitment. Um, but the way you have to run on the wall at Salem kind of takes the commitment level to another degree relative to how you drive sprint cars in other places. But, I, you know, I think it's, it's definitely similar to, probably more similar than other tracks to some of what we see in IndyCar. Um, but, you know, really, the, the time I had, in, whether it was Midget, Sprint Cars, Silver Crown, they're, they're great. Right. So 2003, oh, sorry, Ed, go ahead. No, you're good. Um, no, I was going to say, so 2003 was your, you know, you got kind of your first um, go at um, IndyCar. Your first race was in Chicago with PDM, right? Yep. Um, yeah, then... so, I mean, it, 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 yeah, that all started, really all started with the Freedom 100, too, you know, winning that race put me on the IndyCar map, just being a big event, and um, worked with a guy named Buddy McAtee, he's no longer with us, but he helped, helped me put together some funding for that program, um, and yeah, we were able to do it, put together a three-race package with PDM, um, you know, which was huge, we did I think the best finish was like 13th maybe in those three races, but that first race in Chicago, we started pretty far back um, and were, was able to race up into the top 10, you know, kind of multiple times in the race. Um, and after that, you know, that that opened up the door to, to drive for Eddie and actually talk to a couple of other owners back then that, that were interested. Um, you know, so it was cool. And, and those weekends I did those races, I was also still racing in New Lights, so doing double duty back then which you don't see much anymore right no absolutely um so then 2004 your first year at indy um and i'm sure it's got to be kind of surreal i mean i'm you know i'm sure you watched the race a lot went to the race when you were a kid so what what was it like to actually you know be able to race in it it's pretty overwhelming your your first time or you know it, it it's it was nice to have the lights experience, but when you get IndyCar, it's a whole, whole different level. Um, you know, the speed, the the length of the races, it's, it's such a big transition. Yeah, you, I think I was ready, but you're you're never as ready as you think you are, and there's way more that you need to learn than, than what you think you need to learn. Uh, but, you know, it's... My, my rookie year was tough in a lot of ways, Indy included. You know, we didn't have the fastest package at that point um, at Cheever. But it was still a, a great learning experience, you know, working with Eddie, who was the, another 500 winner, and Davey Hamilton was working with me kind of as a spotter and driver coach. Um, 
you learn, you know, I probably learned more from things I did wrong or the team did wrong and failures from that season than I did from things that went well. Um, but it was, at the time, it was a pretty brutal year, but looking back, it was pretty formative into, into kind of how I was able to, to progress. And been when I got to you know, kind of the part of the career where we were building vision racing and then, then ECR, you, know, you, you go back to experiences from the very beginning, you know, and lessons that you learned at the different places along the way and how, how you want to do it when you're on your own. What's that like um, being a car owner and a driver? I mean, that's that's such a big load, uh, I I would think. Um, kind of, I mean, because, you, you know, you're worried about it on both sides. Yeah, it's definitely different. Um, I, I actually really enjoy it. I don't know that it's for everyone. And, you know, I... I had, I wouldn't say I'd always thought about owning a team, but definitely by the time, you know, 2000, from 2005 onwards, you know, I had hoped that one day I would be able to own a team. Um, but I don't know that I ever planned or expected it to be in an owner-driver role, but it, it's just kind of the way it happened, and opportunities present themselves and you have to make decisions of uh, do I do this now or try to wait and do it later and for me when we started at Carpenter Racing it was it was really just about the opportunity and not passing on something that we had the opportunity to do not knowing if the the chance would come again if if I didn't do it um and you know, it, it definitely, it was, I would say it was for sure, I'm better at it now than I was then, just from, you know, the sake of having 10 years of experience now, but it, it, it's very important being in this role to have, have the right leadership of the team, uh, the right working relationships and trust levels to be able to kind of come and go, turn it on and off. Because it's, so, you can't, when you're, dri when you're driving, you know, I can't be thinking about right. you know, the, the so team like, in the sense of I, that I do when I'm, you know, more in the ownership part of my schedule. So like today, I, mean, I think today's a great example of that. Uh, at what point are you just a driver? Because you're testing today, I mean, obviously. Um, so, I mean, at what point do you just turn that, that other, your other role over to someone else? And, um, yeah, you know, how, how do you know what, I mean, has it already started? I mean, on this drive down here, you're already becoming more of a driver mode and then, you know, you've got somebody else kind of handle more of the, the ins and outs of being an owner or how does that work for you? Yeah, um, yeah. So Tim Broyles is our our team manager, general manager, and he's been with the team since we started. He he was under Derek Walker, who was kind of the GM when we we first started the team. And when Derek left to go to IndyCar, Tim moved up into that role, and he does a great job. So I mean, we we worked together for ten years now. Really good relationship. At this point, it's almost like a we're brothers in some ways, or I joke and say that he's my other dad, but <laughs> brothers is probably more accurate the way we, the way we are with each other. But yeah, I mean, it, after 10 years, you know, he, he knows what I'm thinking. I know how he works. There's a deep level of trust, but it, yeah, it starts like for me, this test, it started yesterday. I had a meeting at, I had a meeting at noon. Um, and when that meeting was over, you know, I was kind of, fully back to fully focusing on on today um that was my engineer we went through the run plan and you know the rest of the day was kind of setting up today getting prepared watching last olympics last night to get to bed early 
I'm getting hydrated, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's always conversations, but, but, you know, the majority of my, my brain power is just focused on what we need to accomplish at this test and getting prepared for, you know, for what's my last, last race of the season this year. Well, hopefully that changes in the future schedules. Hopefully we can get, uh, some more ovals. Yeah, it would be great. I mean, I know, I know, I know it's uh, IndyCar would like to, to add more. They don't want us to have as few as what we have right now, but we'll just, just keep being patient. And well, it's got to work, right? There, I, won't, I won't be that angry. Yeah, it's got to work. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's an interesting, interesting dynamic to try to put, put a schedule together. Um, but hopefully there'll be some opportunities that, that are coming fairly soon. Yeah, I, I hope so. In a test like today, what do you what are you really hoping to accomplish? Um, I mean, it's a wide window, uh, obviously, so you can run in the day a little bit for like the early part of the race, and then at, you get that night feel for what the track does at night. Um, what what are you looking to accomplish today? Uh, I mean, a little bit of everything. You know, we did need Green and Storm myself. Neither of us qualified very well here last year, so. Um, you know, we need to work on the qualifying balance a little. And the way the test is set up today, starting at one and then running to 10, you know, it, it really works well kind of to, to go through how how the race day is going to be like. You know, we'll be qualifying in the daylight and the heat of the day and then racing into the, into the night as it cools off. So um, that's kind of how we'll approach today, really. We'll once we get our baseline out of the way and we'll go through some through our test items that we want to test, which will be, you know, a lot of them would be relevant for qualifying and race. Um, you know, so we'll be doing short runs in the daytime, time which will be qualifying. And then once we get into the evening, then, then we'll shift to, to long runs and focusing on the race as the, as the track cools off and the sun starts to go down just to to be in line with what the schedule is going to look like so be doing we'll be doing both you know i think our race cars have been much better than than our qualifying cars so there there will be an emphasis on on qualifying better it's not, not the easiest place to pass the new tire this year uh, compared to last year so obviously we've got to got to sort that out and understand that quickly um, you know, but it's a, it's an important day because I think it's that it's us and Andretti, Boyd and Coyne, I think coming over here. Yeah. So McLaren was really strong here last year. Penske was really strong. Penske will be here with McLaughlin today too, but not with the rest of their crew. So, you know, some of the guys that were really strong last year aren't aren't testing. So it's an opportunity for us to to hopefully get a handle on on this tire and you know to be able to unload when we come back little better than those guys and get a leg up on them when firestone changes a tire i mean do you is it uh, are these incre- incremental type changes that they're just small differences or can they just be wildly different than what you've run before yeah i mean it can be it can be either i mean they have a lot of different things they can change um they do tell us what they change okay whether it's with the construction or a compound, uh, right sides, left sides. So we have an idea of, of what it'll do and what they think it'll do. And, you know, we know historically how, how the car responds to certain types of tire changes just from over the years. But you, know, you get it on track, you never, you never really know. You know, we haven't driven this exact combination at gateway but you know it, it should be it should be a better tire than last year uh, with with covid last year and full swing it affected a lot of things and tire production was one of them because their production was was shut down for a while so gateway along with a couple other races was a venue where we ran tires that they wouldn't have exactly run there had they been able to be at, at full production so you know, this is more so a tire they had wanted to, to take the gateway last year, but just weren't able to, 
to get it into production. So pretty, it's, it's pretty interesting some of the things that, that all of us had to deal with last year. But it'll definitely be a little different tire than, than what we had. Right. Um, so kind of circling back a little bit. So when you look at, you know, when you guys started 2004, 2005, 2006, um, you started, you know, having some really good finishes. And um, at some point you had a couple second place finishes in Kentucky. And finally you got your first one in 2011. So what's that like to, I guess, be so close and then to finally, um, you know, finally get that win? Oh, I mean, it, it was awesome. You know, I, we had, I got my first pole at Kentucky in 2010, um, finished, finished, finished second, which that, that was, you know, over, over the course of time before you get your first win, there's so many close calls. If I remember right, that race that I finished second in 2010 there, we were really set up to win. Dan Weldon and I were teammates and it was the two of us running out front mostly. And I remember coming in for the final pit stop when we pitted, I think, a lap apart, but we were running nose to tail first and second, and I beat him in the pit cycle pretty handedly, and I was thinking that that was the day and I was going to get the first win, but somewhere along the line, like, Elio had had a bad pit stop under a yellow, didn't get a tire on, and he came back in to, to fix that, and... They, they topped off, and that top off, he was able to make it to the end. Like, I think we stopped with, like, three to go for a splash, and he was able to make it to the end. So that was one that day where you thought you were going to win and, and didn't, and then to be able to go back there the, the following year and, and get it done um, in, a, in a great race with Dario, who, to me, to, to go – toe to toe with a guy like that was probably as validating as the win itself just because he's you know, Dario's a legend and Right. Now, I remember uh, that one against guys like that just just because that's you know, it feels good to, to beat someone that's been so successful for your first win. Oh, absolutely. I, I think one of those years at Kentucky was when Dario um, flipped because the race before it was two races in a row. I think he got upside down. Yeah, he had a tough go there for a while after the, after the finish. Right. Um, and then obviously, you know, Indy 500, you've you've had just uh, yeah, just one second place finish. But I mean, you, you know, you've been there um, up up near the front and, you know, most the past few Indy 500s. So, I mean, I guess, obviously, you've got the pull at Indy three times. Um, first off, really, what what does it, when you, this, this is a question I, I really, um, you know, ask a lot of drivers who've interviewed that driven the 500. What does Indy, when you when you think of the name or the word Indy, what does it, what's the first thing that comes to your mind or what does it mean to you? Um. You know, I mean, for me, I think, like, the, the driver that I think the most of with Indy is, is A.J. Foyt, for me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he, he was probably the first driver that I was closest to growing up. He and Al Jr. were, were both really close with my family. Um, Wendy Lights for A.J. He and my mom were both on, helped on his pit crew when I was growing up. So I was connected to him, but AJ and the 500 to me just go together. Um, you know, but the race itself, you know, it, it it means everything to me. You know, it's like you when you, you asked at the earlier in the interview. You know, the the goal for me was always the Indy 500. It was always where I wanted to get to in in racing. You know, that was always the pinnacle for me and. A lot of guys, their pinnacle starts out as Formula One or or something else, and then they find their way to Indy and fall in love with it, and then that's where they want to be. But for me, it was always it was always that was always where I wanted to be from the beginning. Um, you know, and it's I feel pretty pretty blessed to to be competing still and has had 
to have had as many 500s as I've had. Um, and you go through having raced it for so long and been so close and had, you know, highs and lows of Indy, you know, at some point in your career, you feel like, you know, your career probably won't be complete if you don't win Indy. Um, you know, but having raced it so many times, you know, I've, I think I've come to respect it to the point and it's so hard to win that I'm, I'm still haven't given up and I'm going to keep coming back and, and trying to win the race. Hopefully we'll win the race. Um, but, you know, it, it's so, so stinking hard to win. I mean, but that, that's what makes it so awesome. Yeah, the hard's what makes it great, right? I mean... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just as a as a person, you know, when when you kind of come into the family and and you started racing and and the place obviously was, you know, essentially your place. Um, does it still hold that same magic it does for other people? I, I assume it does, but. Uh, we talk about every, almost every driver we've talked to talks about, you know, the, the first time when you roll under that, not only have to be the first time, but every time you roll under that trunk, the tunnel, uh, in, in, uh, off, uh, 16th street and just the vibes that place gives. Um, I mean, is that something that you get or is it something you've been there so often that you love and admire it, but it may not have that same effect on you? No, it's still the same, you know. It's, yeah. I, I, one, I've never felt like it was mine. Um, you know, to me, Indy belongs to everyone that, that loves it. Um, right. You know, I think that's, that's part of what makes the 500 so special is just it is, it is an Indy's event. You know, Indianapolis transforms in May. And it really starts in April, just living here when you drive around town. You know, you can just feel it coming before it even gets there. And, yeah, I mean, every time I get to the Speedway, you know, it, it, it puts me in a good mood, whether it's whether it's May or November. Um, just, just a place that I love being. And, you know, I think the way I was raised, I, I never, I never felt like it was ours. I remember pretty, pretty clearly. I think I was in, it was probably in middle school. I don't remember what month it was, but I went out there with Tony. Um, we were working out. He's like, let's go, let's go to the track and run in the bleachers. And I was like, cool. So we were, we were over running, running up and down the bleachers in turn two and the near turn two. And a yellow shirt who was on, <laughs> on duty came up and was like, Hey, you guys can't, you guys can't be running here. <laughs> and, you know, I was young enough at that point. You know, and I'm with, with Tony, who's the president. And I'm expecting him to be like, no, you know, we can run here. You know, I'm the president. And Tony was like, okay, we'll leave. And the guy didn't oh, recognize wow. him somehow. And, we got in the car and I was like, how come you, how come we just left? How come we didn't keep running? And he's like, well, he was doing his job. There, people aren't supposed to be up there running. So I, I respected him when he asked us to leave. And yeah, that, that was a big thing. You know, something that stuck with me just because it's, wow. You know, Tony never yeah. had an ego about things like that. And he, doing his job because if it, didn't ask us to leave that, you know, would he have asked someone else to leave that wasn't supposed to be there? Um, you know, so I, I don't know if that totally makes sense to what the question you asked, but, um, yeah, I've oh, I think it does. Being there. Even, yeah. I, I, know I had opportunity to, to be there in a different way than, than other people. I think uh, that, I, I think that's a real, uh, I think that's good insight too. I think I, that's, 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 um, that's good. I, I appreciate that story. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it, it'd been easy to make that guy's day hard. Um, yeah. And, and, and he turned it. Do you, not, do you not know who I am? Right. The thing. It was like, okay. It shows a lot of humility. Sure that the guy was doing his job. Yeah. I, 
I always kind of look at the Speedway as um, it belongs to everybody, but there are people who pay for the rights to own the keys. That's how I've always kind of viewed it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so for Tony, for Tony, it really, I think Roger fully accepted this, and it was a big part of the reason, I think, why he wanted to, to, to purchase it. You know, but for Tony, you know, so much of it was about stewardship. Um, right, and carrying on his grandfather's legacy and dream and vision of of what he wanted it to be, and you know that was Rogers told the story, and I think Tony had told the story when when the transaction was was made public. But you know that the first conversation you know, about about the sale, you know, was about stewardship. It wasn't about Hey, do you want to buy the Speedway? You know, it was about it was about stewardship and leadership, and you know, the next the next generation, the next legacy of of carrying on you know Tony Holman's vision. And I think that's that's why you know, Roger was the perfect guy because he understands that and and has the same passion and vision and commitment and, and resources to to continue elevating you know, what, what the Speedway is and what it can, can be and continue to be. Yeah, I, I, I mean, as an outsider, I couldn't agree more. Um, I just, honestly, I mean, I felt it was a, the, I mean, if, if you've got to sell it, it was by far the best business decision, I, you know, maybe Tony ever made. Um, it, it, considering that COVID was looming, uh, there's, I don't know how many other owners could have got through COVID the way Roger did. Um, so if it had to, if it had to it's change something, hands, it's something that it's something that I'm glad that we don't have to know how it would have gone. You know, yep. I think yep. Roger did a phenomenal job through COVID. You know, I think I think that we would have figured it out had had it still been under the same ownership, but. Um, Roger did a great job. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so when, when we kind of wrap up these interviews, Scott has a question that he always likes to ask. Um, I do. Um, again, uh, some of these, some of the interviews, the, the, the influences are so obvious. It, it's, uh, it's a little uh, anticlimactic asking this question, but um you know, I I always think I kind of know what the answer is going to be before I ask it, but I'll definitely ask it. Uh, what uh, looking back through your career, who who would be that one person that you could just point to and say, man, that person really was my driving force, was uh, the person who made a huge difference in my career. I mean, I could name quite a few, you know, but I think. My parents are, are the number one My. Uh, providing an opportunity for me to to have an opportunity to race, um, giving me the resources to to have time to develop, you know, to to get to IndyCar. I could there's no way I could have done it without their support, um, emotionally, financially, you know, just as parents, you know, and, and then from there. It, Really, everyone that you ever work with, you know. I mean, they, right. my year at Cheever was so rough and and well, you know. But I, I learned so many things from Eddie and Max Jones, who I worked with. You know, you, you learn things from engineers that that you really love working with. You learn things from engineers that you really hate working with. Um, <laughs> you know, I've always tried to. I've always tried to to take the positives out of any situation and if you don't really see it at the time but you know upon reflection uh, you learn something from from every situation whether it's good and bad um so i mean it's we learn from everyone along the way um you know even in the more current times you know, I, I learned a lot about ownership 
from from Derek when he was helping us build Ed Carpenter Racing in the beginning. It gave me a different perspective on on team building and success from his experience at his team and and Penske. You know, so it's it's a continual progression. You know, I, I, there's still big people making an impact and and how I and how I operate and how I continue to try to get better. But you know, definitely my parents are are number one just because I I wouldn't have been here without them. Sure. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, that one's so obvious. Um, but I mean, it's the, the great thing about Tony, I think was that he had a real passion for racing himself. Um, you know, I don't know if people remember or not, you know, obviously Tony ran midgets and legends cars and he drove in the lower open wheel series. So he, he too had a, a huge passion for it that I'm sure, um, you got you know, you got the benefits of just from being around it. Yeah. I mean, it, and he got, you know, it's just been something that we've all loved forever and still do. You know, I mean, even, even grandma Mary, you know, she, she owned race cars and, and ran a race. For sure. Yep. When she was, when she was young. So, you know, all of us have, have, I like the family was just connected to it from a ownership and promoter side. You know, I think everyone connected to the actual driving side you know, much as as much as the ownership stewardship side of it from the very beginning. Right. Well, Ed, um, th- thank you so much for doing this once again. Really do appreciate it. No problem. Hey, thanks a lot, Ed. And uh, we will be there. I will definitely be there when you win uh, when you're 500. It's coming. Well, you guys been you. you've well, been too be too good for too long. So you'll you'll get yours. Thank you. Still working. That's right. Just keep grinding. Well, I hope um, the gateway test goes well and the rest of the season goes well, and um, I'll definitely see you at the track. Sounds good. Thanks, Ed.